All right, well, this is a good setup. I want to take a moment to uh, say thank you for having me tonight and giving me the opportunity to speak with everyone here and about uh, our programs at Galveston Bay Foundation and uh, give you a, an overview of, of what we do and uh, how it impacts um, native plants in the area and how it impacts our, our uh, regional landscape here. I'll give you a quick background on myself. As uh, Janice mentioned, I'm an, I'm an Aggie. I went to school at Texas A&M, got a degree in wildlife and fishery sciences. Uh, spent a little time out in Florida as a, as a wildlife biologist, working primarily with uh, threatened and endangered species, uh, doing some really neat work with species management with Florida scrub jays and gopher tortoises and indigo snakes, and uh, some really high profile uh, T and E species out there. I then took a job uh, with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission uh, to do uh, work with private landowners to help them manage uh, their properties for uh, their personal interests. A lot of it was related to hunting uh, deer and turkey and quail, and uh, I really got a, a good feel for land management and what it takes to manage properties for uh, native, native landscapes, specifically for quail. As quail uh, are more uh, habitat specific and have a little higher uh, needs than other habitat generalists like deer and turkeys. But so quail was was really uh, really neat for me to get to work with and, and uh, create habitat for them. Um, so I guess I can go ahead and get started. Or, or you, I'll, I'll get for you. Okay. All right. So uh, who here has uh, has heard of the Galveston Bay Foundation? A lot of people here are familiar with our our organization. We're uh, housed uh, down in the Clear Lake area. We we um, try to situate ourselves halfway between Houston and Galveston. Um, we're managed by a 25 person board of directors and uh, also have a 25 person staff that includes uh, a couple part-timers and a bunch of interns that roll through the door in and out and, uh, and support it. We are a member-based organization so you can become a member of the Galveston Bay Foundation. Uh, we have about 3,500 members throughout the region and uh, we also engage about 3,000 volunteers per year. Our projects span the um, the entire base system in the watershed, which I'll talk a little about our watershed in a minute here, um, but uh, working uh, not only in, in Galveston, on Galveston Island, is, is one of those, the efforts we make uh, to educate people about what we do. A lot of people associate Galveston Bay with Galveston Island, and there's a lot more to Galveston Bay than just the island itself. Um, so our mission is, to, is pretty straightforward, to preserve, protect, and enhance the natural resource of Galveston Bay system uh, and its tributaries. And uh, we, we try to work with all the users of the bay, that's the, the commercial fishermen, the industrial users, the recreational uh, users, kayakers, paddlers, uh, as well as um, uh, the, the commercial fisheries as well. So uh, our, our bay system is a very large and complex uh, estuary system. Estuary is where the fresh water from rivers and tributaries, bayous, creeks, um, runs off into, into this uh, body of water and mixes with uh, salt water from the ocean. It creates this brackish uh, water uh, that's highly diverse for, for fish and wildlife species. Our bay system is about uh, 660 square miles, so it's pretty large. It's the uh, seventh largest in the country, the largest in Texas. It averages about eight feet deep. Uh, and we have four major sub bays that we call them. Uh, one is West Bay, which is uh, from about uh, Galveston uh, down through the San Luis Pass. The main uh, body water is called Galveston Bay. Then there's uh, Trinity Bay, where Trinity River enters into the bay system, and then East Bay is the southern portion of the bay, just north of Pollard Peninsula. Um, we cover about four, uh, four main counties, Brazoria, Harris, Chambers, and Galveston County. We, um, uh, it's important, I want to mention our, our sources of water. Uh, very important for the, the bay system is, is fresh water, uh, and fresh water inflows, something I'll talk about a little bit in a minute. Uh, but our fresh water comes from the San Jacinto River and the Trinity River primarily, and uh, those are, those are uh, rivers that are very stressed from human, human use of water, and uh, something to consider long term, and when we're talking about uh, proper use of water, uh, is, is how much water gets devoted to Galveston Bay to make sure that our salinities stay appropriate for our environment here. Um, our tidal exchange comes from the ocean uh, through, through three, uh, really two main points. Bolivar Roads, which is the, where the Galveston jetties are, where the big ships, Houston Ship Channel comes in there. If you've ever ridden the ferry across from Galveston to Bolivar Peninsula, you're, it's about two miles wide, you're crossing the Bolivar Roads. And that's the main source of salt water and, uh, and flushing for our, our bay system. There's a smaller pass, a natural pass at the end of the west end of Galveston Island called San Luis Pass. Uh, 
and that uh, we also have rollover paths, which is a man-made channel cut through Baller Peninsula that, that helps flush some, uh, some salt water and fresh water in and out of East Galveston Bay. Uh, our watershed is large. We focus primarily on the southern, or the southern end of this, the, what's called the Lower Galveston Bay watershed, which is south of um, the uh, Lake uh, Conroe, Lake Livingston, or Lake Houston, Lake Livingston dams. Um, we uh, typically work uh, south of I-10 historically. Um, what's unique about our watershed is that it is large. The Trinity River is one of our major sources of fresh water. Uh, has a lot of people to live. About half the people in Texas live in the Galveston Bay watershed because we, we take uh, into account all the Houston area and the, the, the residential um, folks, industrial users that, that are living here and operating here, and then also the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex as well, which is another major uh, population center for the, for the state of Texas. So, some of the issues that we face, the, the main thing we try to address is uh, the loss or degradation of our coastal habitats. And these are wide ranging from uh, coastal prairies, is something you're probably very interested in, but also things we focus on, uh, folks a lot of our efforts on are, are coastal wetlands, estuarine and freshwater wetlands, uh, seagrasses, oyster beds, and, and also the native grasslands. Um, some of the, the uh, issues that we're facing, that we're, we're seeing, affect these, uh, uh, these habitats. and, and contributing to their, their loss or degradation is uh, issues like uh, subsidence, which was uh, a phenomenon that happened between the 50s and the 80s where uh, industrial users in the, in the, in the Galveston Bay region, uh, petrochemical plants and, and others, were drawing so much water out of the ground that it actually shrank our ground and we lost a lot of our wetland uh, habitats just actually sank underwater uh, so rapidly that they couldn't migrate up into other more appropriate uh, levels of water. So we lost about 40,000 acres of wetlands in a, in a relatively short period of time. Um, also, we have erosion forces from, uh, from wind-driven erosion from Houston Ship Channel uh, and the Intercoastal Waterway eroding our banks and our shorelines uh, every year. Uh, pollution, uh, commercial, residential, and suburban development. Um, uh, is, is, you know that Houston's a, a very uh, sprawling uh, area. We have uh, the, the petrochemical industry here is very productive and, and very economically uh, uh, supportive of the area, but it also has its, 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 uh, its issues with, as it interacts with Galveston Bay. Uh, invasive species are something that we probably all recognize as a, a major issue. Uh, we spend a lot of our time and effort and, uh, and, and funding fighting invasive species in our native areas, things like Chinese tallow, privet, uh, deep-rooted sedge, and others, Brazilian pepper. Uh, the list goes on and on. And there's also invasive uh, animal species as well um, that are uh, causing degradation of our habitats. So we have a, an increased need for land conservation to address some of these issues. Uh, we deal a lot with water, uh, but land is uh, critical to clean water and, and uh, quantity of water coming into the bay. So protecting land is, is really essential to our efforts to have a, uh, a really productive bay system. Uh, we have some very serious long-term concerns about the amount of fresh water coming into the bay, uh, not having enough water to uh, dedicate it to uh, come, coming into the bay to uh, provide for suitable salinities. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about freshwater inflows in a minute. Uh, some of our uh, legacy pollutants and bacteria uh, in the bay system coming, in, coming into our basin from, from sediments uh, and also poor water quality in general. Uh, coming down from bayous and industrial areas uh, throughout the Bay region. And also, uh, just a, a general lack of awareness of where Galveston Bay is, that it even exists. A lot of times we work with uh, kids or even adults that live in the Houston area that don't even know where Galveston Bay is. So it's, it's been a little bit of a, uh, a challenge to, to just educate people that this is a resource you have in your backyard and what you do in Houston and Katy and the woodlands affects how it operates as, a, as an ecological system. So we try to address these issues with four main targeted program areas. Uh, first is advocacy. We want to encourage you know, solutions to some of these very complex problems that we are experiencing and find, uh, find ways to incorporate all the users of the bay, from the industrial users, the shipping industries, the petrochemical plants, as well as the, the kite boarders and kayakers and recreational fishermen and oystermen, all come together try to provide a forum for ideas and a way to make uh, our bay uh, better long-term and sustainable for everyone to use. Uh, secondly is uh, our conservation program. This is part of the program that I, I work under. 
we have a uh, robust operation of, of uh, uh, not only land conservation, but also habitat restoration, where we're creating oyster reefs and seagrass beds and estuarine marshes, and uh, trying to pr provide uh, pr protection against some of these issues that we talked about earlier with erosional forces and, and pollution. Uh, we have an education program that's, that's very um, active in our uh, local schools. We work with over 50 schools uh, throughout the region to educate them on uh, the, the needs of our bay system long term, trying to develop a, uh, a conservation ethic uh, within the young, young uh, people in our communities. And then also we have uh, adult education through hands-on restoration activities where we get them out into the marsh, into a restoration project to try and give them a, a, a memory that's going to last uh, and maybe they'll change the behavior long term, how they, how they act, if they're going to throw a, throw a bottle out the window or uh, just um, if they're going to even uh, put something down the drain that might affect uh, something they've been, they've been uh, part of helping to recreate. And then uh, research, uh, to a much lesser extent, uh, this is more of a supportive role. We want to encourage research uh, in, for our base system and maybe identify some things that, that we uh, are, are missing, uh, help, uh, help us find uh, projects that are worthwhile of our time and efforts and make sure that we're doing things the right way. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about our uh, water programs. Uh, this is a uh, uh, pretty uh, significant uh, portion of our, our staff uh, is dedicated to just water. As, it, as our name uh, uh, suggests, we're very, very tied to Galveston Bay and, and the, 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 the quality of our water as well as the quantity of our water. So we have a program that's, uh, that's been uh, going on for about uh, two or three years now, our rain barrel program where we're subsidized the the sale of uh, rain barrels and the equipment that we can uh, that's used to install them in, in residential uh, households, where they can capture rainwater and use them to uh, use that water to uh, irrigate their their lawns or their flowers or their plants. Something people uh, in this room might have an interest in is capturing rainwater and using it so it doesn't go down the storm drain and carry uh, those uh, pollutants or or anything else down the drain with it. Uh, second is our freshwater inflows. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're very concerned about the, the amount of water coming into the bay. This year, uh, we actually had you know a lot of rain, uh, but in, in drought years when water becomes scarce, uh, there's there's some pretty significant uh, political uh, uh, movements right now to to capture rain, uh, the the use of water for residential uses or agricultural uses or industrial uses, and uh, there's going to continue to be as as our population increases and our demand for water increases, we're going to have some pretty significant um, challenges to designate water just for environmental purposes coming into the bay to, to regulate salinities. Uh, I want to talk about uh, one thing about oysters. Uh, oysters is a, a big component of what we do and what we advocate for. Um, oysters are, uh, require a certain salinity uh, to, uh, to survive and to reproduce. Uh, they're very important for, for filtering our water in our bay system. Uh, a single oyster can filter uh, up to 50 gallons of water in a day. We like to do a demonstration at our at some of our educational events, where we take a, uh, a, a cluster of live oysters and put them in a tank of dirty water, and, and over the course of an hour or so, those those eight or ten oysters will filter that that water out and make it clear clear. And uh, so it's really uh, Kind of helps people visualize what these what these critters are actually doing to our water and our basis. Also, it's a it's a huge um, economic driver for the area. The oyster industry is uh, valued over twelve million dollars annually, uh, and that's just one small or one component of the commercial fisheries that's uh, that's tied to Galveston Bay. Um, so, on the other hand, just not the amount of water, but the the, the quality of water coming into our bay is very important to us. So as we as we have um, as you know if you live in Houston there's a lot of uh, bayous and creeks that, that flow into uh, the Houston Ship Channel or to uh, other tributaries that lead down to Galveston Bay and carry a lot of things with it that are that are uh, not great for the environment. So we have uh, developed a, a, a whole bunch of, of uh, partnerships and, and campaigns and programs to try to address this uh, from an education standpoint and also a, you know changing practices standpoint. Uh, one of them is our clean water partnerships. We have advisories for uh, for fish consumption. Uh, one one thing that's uh, been a really hot news topic right now is the San Jacinto waste pits. We've been very very active in in, uh, in our advocacy program to um, uh, to try to promote the, the uh, proper cleanup of that waste site. 
that's a, a site that's been uh, was an old paper mill that, uh, due to subsidence um, that I talked about back in the 50s and 60s, uh, sank and it was was historically above water. When when the ground uh, subsided and went underwater, it was releasing PCBs and dioxin out into our water source, and it's uh, it's it's captured in the sediment. So as you notice from our, our bayous and rivers here, they're they're muddy rivers, and they they're produ pr uh, providing all this sediment into our into our bay system, which settles out and feeds our marshes and, and helps provide for a, a very productive ecosystem. It also can, can attach to these very, very harmful pollutants. And uh, this is a, a major, major uh, source of, of dioxin that could potentially impact our, our bay system and cause uh, extremely long-term effects on the, the viability of, of using our, our bay in the way we, we do traditionally. Um, we also have a, a new... Um, Galveston Bay Action Network. Uh, it's, it's a mobile-friendly website now. It will soon be an app you can download. And this is to try and capture some of these uh, smaller pollution events that go typically go unnoticed. And uh, working with our regulatory authorities uh, to just get the information from uh, citizens out in, out in the, uh, the communities. If they see something that looks uh, uh, suspect, they can report it and it will be automatically generated, uh, generate a report and sent to the appropriate um, regulatory authorities so they can investigate that. And our, our hope is that this will reduce response times and increase uh, enforcement of, of current laws that are, that are sometimes very difficult to enforce, especially when people are doing things at night or in their neighborhoods and there's only so many regulatory officials that are out there and those agencies are typically understaffed. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about our water quality monitoring. Um, this is a, a citizen science uh, scientist program where we're actually training uh, citizens to come in and, and uh, take water samples from all around the bay and bring them into our, our lab on site and uh, test them for uh, primarily pteropods, which is the bacteria. And but we also test for uh, uh, dissolved oxygen and, up, and uh, several other parameters as well. So I mentioned about our Clean Water Partnerships, who we're working with to try and, and change how we uh, affect our, our, our water quality throughout the Bay. And it's, it's been unique because we've, we've been working with cities and municipalities as well as marinas in the Clear Lake area. There's over 6,000 uh, wet slips for sailboats. And as you can imagine, those have a potential to have a really high level of, of, uh, of bacteria input into those bay systems. We have little boards and, and bathrooms on site. Uh, typical practice is just to release that waste material right into the water. And uh, so we're trying to, to enforce some laws to, uh, to make people pump that out into an appropriate sanitary uh, processing facility. Go ahead. I mentioned our water, uh, quality, water quality monitoring team. Uh, these are, uh, I think we're over 50 now, but you can see where they're taking uh, samples all around the bay. Uh, so we can get a better uh, impact, a better idea of what impacts are happening uh, after a rain event or after a, uh, a chemical spill or something along those lines. And we're actually, uh, the Houston uh, Advanced Research Center is actually using this data in some of their, uh, their forecasting on, on uh, various initiatives they're, they're working on. So we're trying to gather uh, sound data that can be used and, and, and utilizing citizens to do that. Um, I mentioned our, our uh, seafood consumption advisories. There are some uh, uh, state mandated uh, consumption advisories for, for specific fish species. And uh, we uh, went out and handed out uh, thousands of flyers and put up signs in, in these areas. They're typically in the northern part of the bay. You can kind of see in these areas uh, the, the Houston Ship Channel and uh, the Taz Bay area uh, north towards the Fred Harmon Bridge. And a lot of the, we found is a lot of people that are, are uh, fishing in those areas and consuming those fish are uh, uh, English is their second language and they don't speak English at all. And um, so we're working with uh, to put up signs uh, in multiple languages to try to keep people to make people aware that there's an issue here. And some of these people are fishing for uh, subsistence, not just for fun. So it's, we want to make sure they have all the information that they're going to eat these fish and they need to know which fish are, are unsafe to eat and they're going to be fighting with their family. And we want them to have all the information. Uh, secondly, we have a, um, a uh, report card. Uh, this is our second year of our initiating our report card. Uh, it's grading our, our base system. Uh, it's coming out uh, on August 10th of this year, so just in, in a, uh, 
less than a month here now, a couple weeks, we'll be issuing our second annual report card. And this has been a process. Uh, if you hit the slide, uh, oh, these are going to pop up individually. You have to go through them. There we go. Here's some information about our, our uh, report card, the process. We, we polled a bunch of people throughout the area to see what's important to the people that are using the bay. And uh, it came down to water and quality, uh, human health concerns, uh, various geologic and, and climate processes, uh, primarily changing salinities in the bay and sea level rise, and then also habitat and wildlife trends. So it's a, it's a, it's a neat uh, way to take some pretty complex data and put it into a format that people can understand uh, at a very basic level and say, we're, we're doing okay in this field, but we're, we're doing really poorly in some other things. So uh, we're looking forward to see how, how we can uh, use this as a tool to help uh, uh, influence how we do our programs as, as well as how people behave. And then uh, we have a, a kind of a little motto uh, internally that we want to try to get take off is we want to make our, our Galveston Bay a straight A Bay across all these different uh, factors that, are, that are people are interested in, in monitoring. This is a duplicate uh, slide, but you can see the signs we're putting up in some of these fishing piers uh, in the Houston Ship Channel area trying to make people aware that this, this is uh, a potential issue. Primarily, this is, this is for uh, PCBs that are, that are uh, in these fish, uh, primarily catfish species and other fatty species as the, as the fat retains these, these uh, pollutants. <clears throat> in 2014, there was a, um, an oil spill at Texas City. Why? Uh, this was uh, a pretty significant oil spill. And uh, what we found was there was an uh, incredible outpouring of support for, of individuals that wanted to come and help. And uh, the uh, agencies that are in charge of, of the uh, oil spill cleanup and, and monitoring uh, did not, were not staffed prepared to handle volunteers. Uh, they pretty much just said, listen, we have, we have a procedure to, 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 to do this process, and, and we, they're, they're very rigid in their incident uh, command center. And uh, so we uh, worked with them on a very rapid basis to develop a, a, a program, a uh, Sentinel program for 17 days, uh, which engaged uh, over 200 uh, volunteers. They, met, they monitored about 100 miles of uh, bay and beach shoreline for oils and, uh, and oil, wildlife, and everything else. So they were able to uh, use people to, that, that, are, that are not tied to a, a regulatory agency or the Coast Guard or any other formal agency and get people out to actually make a difference and try to try to uh, help with the in, a, in the wake of a, of a of an oil spill. So after that uh, that short uh, program of uh, 17 days, as a result of that oil spill, we refined this into a more formal um, program. And now, if you are if you ever hear on the news of an oil or chemical spill, you can contact Galveston Bay Foundation. We are approved through an MOA with the uh, the Coast Guard and Texas General Land Office to. Uh, monitor and, and direct volunteers and, and how the, and, and help them uh, accomplish their, their goals of monitoring the, the oil spill and the effects of it. Our educational programs are diverse as well. We have six different programs offered for adult and uh, children. Uh, uh, and uh, like I said earlier, it's about 50 schools or over 50 schools that we are, we are working with annually uh, to reach over 5,000 students uh, per year. We have uh, uh, various programs we do. One of my favorite ones is the Hip to Habitat program, which uh, uh, school-aged children come out, harvest marsh grass from a, from a nursery, uh, take it back to their school, and grow it out in, in baby pools. They put it in pots and uh, monitor salinities to, to make sure that this grass grows correctly. And then at the end of the, the semester, bring it back out into the bay and plant it into a, a restoration site. And, uh, and create marsh. So it's a pretty neat program that people, that the, the young age, uh, young kids really get uh, a hands-on experience and, and a really good um, long-term uh, benefit out of it. Uh, I wanted to mention our Trinity Bay Discovery Center. We bought a 17-acre uh, property in Beach City uh, and um, we are developing it into an educational facility to uh, bring students for camps, e ecological-based camps, to educate them on the various uh, habitat restoration or uh, uh, water quality monitoring programs that we do and uh, trying to develop this into a, uh, this is our first education center that's, that's uh, outside of our, our main office and try to eventually have these throughout the Bay system to uh, serve the local communities uh, nearby. So this one is up in Trinity Bay uh, near the Mont Bellevue area in, in what's called as Beach City. Um, 
So that's a, a really neat, neat project for us. Uh, I just mentioned the Hip to Habitat um, program where you can see the kids here planting it in, uh, into a restoration, planting their, their grass they grew into a restoration site. Uh, what's, what's neat about this program is 75% of the uh, participating students are from uh, a minority or low income family and most of these children are never exposed to uh, the natural environment, the bay or the beach or anything. So they, a lot of them, this is their first experience coming to Galveston Bay and it's really neat to see their, their eyes light up and, and uh, feel like making a difference. Um, one of our adult educational uh, restoration based uh, projects is called Marsh Mania. This is our annual pro program where we go out and uh, people sign up and come out and, and plant marsh grass. So uh, we restored over 200 acres using this model over time and uh, involved over 7,500 participants. And this is an example of what, what happens after marsh mania. They, they take these individual plant stems of smooth core grass, which is uh, Spartina alterniflora. I know you guys are interested in a lot of different plants. We're very, very centric on Spartina alterniflora because that's our, our primary uh, estuary marsh grass. But they plant these stems along these uh, restoration areas, and over time, uh, they, these, uh, they spread by rhizomes and, and seed and fill in these areas to dig uh, thick, uh, dense marsh areas that provide habitat for fish, uh, shrimp, crabs, and other, other marine life. There's another example of a project we did in Burnett Bay, which is in the, in the background. I think you can see the, uh, the, the monument there in, in San Jacinto. And uh, this is a, a project where we actually came and, and recreated mounds of, uh, of we dredged locally and created these mounds to, to rebuild marsh that was lost due to subsidence. This is one of the heaviest hit areas uh, in the Baytown area, uh, Baytown, San Jacinto River area, where we lo lost probably uh, anywhere from 8 to 10 feet of elevation in land. There's actually whole subdivisions there that went underwater and, and uh, were basically condemned by the city. This is a, a plug for our Bay Day Festival held annually at the King of Boardwalk. It's an, it's an event that we get people out to uh, play with uh, water quality testing stuff. They get to look at some critters and, and uh, experience uh, the Bay at the King of Boardwalk. And uh, just a, a neat event to take family to. Uh, one more shameless plug for our, if there's any cyclists in the, uh, in the, in the uh, group here tonight, uh, we have a uh, fabulous bike ride. It's 180 mile. Uh, bike ride that, that uh, goes all the way around the bay system. It's a two-day ride. We ride from up uh, at the uh, uh, up in the Mount Bellevue area, down through Anahuac and Chambers County, past the Wildlife Refuge, through High Island and down Baller Peninsula, and spend the night in Galveston. And then the next morning they drive up through uh, Texas City, um, Kima, Seabrook, Laporte, and back up to Mount Bellevue. Uh, so it's a it's a pretty uh, physically challenging ride. I'm not a cyclist. I don't ride this. But uh, we are estimated to have about 1,200 riders this year, and uh, we're doing it on the 15th and 16th of October, so hopefully we'll have good weather. Um, now moving on to our conservation programs, I am uh, going to talk about some of our uh, habitat restoration projects. Uh, we have been actively restoring lands uh, since 1991, and uh, we've targeted uh, a lot of estuarine marsh. It's been our, our primary target for, for land uh, restoration. We've also done a significant uh, amount of seagrass restoration. This is the submerged aquatic vegetation, uh, primarily shoal grass and widget grass. And then also rebuilding oyster reefs. Uh, we lost a lot of oyster reefs at Hurricane Ike, and they were covered up by sand that was, uh, that was washed over from uh, Baldwin Peninsula and other, other areas. Uh, and when these oyster reefs were, were covered, we lost probably half of our oyster reefs in East Bay. Uh, so we are uh, actively trying to, to recreate those. There's some really large-scale projects uh, being under, uh, undertaken by state agencies and federal agencies and, and take the Nature Conservancy. We're focusing on more smaller-scale projects because that's what we're able to do. Uh, some of these are being used as, as shoreline erosion control projects. Some of them are, are personal uh, reefs that are being built in front of people's houses uh, to, to augment their fishing success. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, we're still creating more habitat for more oysters in the bay, and that's a good thing overall. Um, we have worked uh, with a lot of communities, community-based restoration, where we, we've uh, invited uh, people to come out and help us as part of our Marsh Mania program. Uh, but we've also done some stuff uh, with, with individual uh, uh, property owners, as well as uh, some pretty large-scale stuff in terms of uh, creating um, uh, creating islands for, for bird rookeries uh, and uh, creating wetlands, uh, tying them for, for foraging habitat. 
We removed a lot of uh, derelict vessels from the, from the bay as part of our grants. Um, a uh, heck of a lot of invasive species control, including a, a significant effort to eradicate, or to control, I should not say eradicate, control Brazilian pepper uh, on the island. Uh, it's a very aggressive uh, plant that you see much more prevalent further south and in uh, more, more uh, uh, subtropical areas like Florida. Uh, but it's a, it's a problem in Galveston Island right now. Uh, here's an example of in the middle here of one of our oyster, our community-based oyster restoration projects. Where we're taking oyster reefs and bagging our oyster shells and bagging them as part of our oyster shell recycling program, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. Uh, but actually using that to, to uh, create a pyramid shaped uh, breakwater to reduce wind driven erosion along the shoreline and as well as uh, create new oyster reefs in this long linear uh, uh, form that parallels the shoreline. Uh, we've uh, restored over 500 acres of estuary habitats. Uh, we've protected 17 miles of shoreline from erosion. Uh, that's resulted in what we calculated as about 13,000 acres of uh, protected uh, uh, habitats, especially low-lying areas that are that are uh, high-quality estuary and, and, and freshwater wetlands. Uh, this uh, big uh, jetty-looking structure is one of our more, more hard structures. Uh, that's we wanted to really barricade this because of the constant uh, erosional forces from the ships going up and down the intercoastal waterway, which is basically like a highway, a shipping highway, and uh, those barges pushing, pushing up and down those uh, that, that channel every day, constantly, 24 hours a day, creates constant motion, wave action, and uh, eventually this this uh, or over time this this uh, intercoastal waterway went from a very narrow and, and channelized uh, uh, waterway. Something that's very wide in some places, sometimes over almost a mile wide in some places. So uh, they've seen some significant erosion on private properties. And this one, this one was done to protect the uh, Anahuac National Wildlife Refuge in partnership with them. We've also done some really uh, neat things with creating uh, marshes in like West Galveston Bay, the bottom right picture, where we're taking uh, harvesting sand from uh, from uh, dredge projects, whether it's you know, dredging the intercoastal waterway or dredging canal subdivisions, instead of just releasing that material. Uh, out into the bay, uh, we've been able to capture that, use it beneficially to create marshes, and in turn uh, protect shorelines and, and regrow uh, lost habitats. And then also, uh, one thing that I've been working on with private landowners the past couple of years is uh, creating and enhancing freshwater wetland habitats. Uh, this this one on the right here, you can see the, the, the ducks flying in there. These are all abandoned rice fields. We've reworked levees uh, to hold water at appropriate depth. And, uh, and really jumpstart their, uh, their wetland plant communities to attract uh, uh, new plants, new insects, and then also birds. Not only what, primarily uh, the landowner's interest is waterfowl, but you have an incredible uh, species diversity that utilizes these freshwater wetlands near the coast. Um, I think I've already touched on uh, debris removal um, and trash cleanups. Uh, we do host the, the trash bash at Arnold Bayou. Uh, this is what I was. This is a really neat project we have. It's uh, our oyster shell recycling program, where we partner with many local uh, restaurants, seafood restaurants, uh, to capture their uh, oyster shells that they that they use for their, their when they serve oysters in a half shell or baked oysters. Instead of dumping those shells into the trash can and going to the landfill, we're recycling those, taking them to a to a destination where we can let them cure for about six months, bag them up, and then put them back in the water to grow oyster uh, oyster reefs. So as you can see here, the, the, the wave action coming over those oyster reefs, breaking, breaking the, the, the wave action offshore, protecting our, our, our wetlands and, and prairies inland. So here's uh, all that was stuff that I don't do. Uh, this, is, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I do. I, I run our land conservation program. And uh, we've been doing this. Uh, we've got our first uh, land project in 1991. It was a small property over in Chambers County called the Shrive Woods, it was about 12 acres. And uh, we've grown that and, into uh, a program that's now pretty sustainable and, and, and we have some targets to, to really make this thing uh, sustainable for a lot, a lot longer and, and grow this program over the next uh, few years into something that's really, really uh, robust and impressive. Uh, today we've, we've acquired uh, almost 8,000 acres of, of land for conservation purposes and uh, these properties are located in four, four counties, Harris, Galveston, Brazoria, and Chambers. The way that we uh, do this uh, conservation uh, process is primarily through two main avenues. One is, is uh, owning property outright. It's called a, a fee simple purchase or acquisition. It can be donated. Um, 
But anyways, but we, we're actually the, the landowners. We've acquired uh, lands, over 3,000 acres of lands that we actually own and manage and, and are, are the stewards of. The second way is a little more complex, and it's called the conservation easement. It's a, a voluntary agreement between a land trust and a landowner. And uh, basically, it restricts the future land use of that property. And, uh, and it can be uh, used for, for a variety of reasons uh, to protect a certain uh, habitat, to protect a water feature, to protect uh, historical structures. Uh, we use it primarily to protect habitat. And um, we do this, uh, uh, we have a, a selection criteria. Uh, when we first started acquiring land, we did some, some deals we probably shouldn't have done, some really small product projects. Uh, 1.9 acres or something very small or, or uh, now we have a, a criteria uh, and a, a selection process that we go through for ident identifying um, consecration uh, areas I, think, I shouldn't say conservation areas but um, <laughs> um, but uh, so we are more, tar more targeted now in trying to affect how our bay and our landscape looks around our bay through our watershed and trying to really do uh, impactful projects that protect uh, habitats and, and uh, plant communities that are either being uh, you know, that we're losing on a, at a high rate, or that we are uh, you know finding that are very important to uh, water quality or wildlife uh, species. Uh, and I want I want to talk about uh, the conservation assistance program. Uh, the Galveston Bay Foundation uh, runs that program in partnership with the uh, Galveston Bay Estuary Program, which is a subsidiary of the TCEQ, and which is the governmental entity. They are not able to go out and uh, do conservation deals like a, a private uh, nonprofit entity could do. They have too much red tape and, and there's some restrictions based on their governmental status. So they've contracted with us to go out and, and do conservation work uh, throughout the, the Galveston Bay watershed. As a portion of that, uh, a significant portion of that is also to provide capacity for other land conservation entities throughout the region. Uh, some uh, some organizations uh, working in the area like Katy Prey Conservancy or the Bio Land Conservancy are much more sophisticated in their, in, their, in their programs. They have staff. There are a lot of smaller entities that are, are understaffed or not staffed at all, uh, all volunteer based, that are still have a mission to uh, protect landscapes throughout the region. And uh, we want to provide capacity to help them uh, accomplish their missions and, uh, and work, do work within the Galveston Bay watershed because their, help, their work helps us accomplish our mission. We are an accredited land trust. I believe there's there's nine in Texas. There might be more than that, um, but uh, at least nine accredited land trusts. And uh, the accreditation process is uh, is run through the Land Trust uh, um, Alliance, which is a national umbrella organization that kind of helps guide uh, the, the land conservation community. Basically, that means that we are uh, abiding by a certain set of criteria and operating in a certain way. That's that's. Uh, uh, thought of as best management practices and keeping up with new regulations uh, for conservation easements and IRS standards and other, other uh, just typical business operation uh, practices. But what it does is it, uh, it promotes consistent conservation efforts across all the, all the uh, accredited land trusts. So if we're doing work here in Galveston Bay region and someone in, in Washington state is doing a land conservation work, it means we're doing a work on the same, uh, playing by the same rules, you know, by the same standard and, and trying to promote permanence of our, our work, make sure that if we're going to protect land, that it, it's going to stand the test of time and, and uh, be permanent. It also builds confidence in the land uh, conservation community for working with a landowner, and we tell them that we are an accredited land trust. It builds confidence that we're going to, up, uh, we're going to uphold our end of the bargain. Um, so identifying the need for land conservation is pretty easy. It's, uh, you can see this map, it's, it's uh, a kind of a heat map. The darker reds are where land is being converted from uh, open space or farms and ranches and, and uh, forests into alternative land uses for development purposes. So you can see it's not surprising that the, the, the darkest red areas are near our major uh, urban areas. Houston, San Antonio, Austin Corridor, Dallas, Fort Worth, El Paso, and the Valley. Um, so uh, our um, th these these are issues that are, these trends are going to continue for the foreseeable future as our population in Houston continues to grow and our urban sprawl continues to expand into more rural communities. Uh, so we need to make sure that we are uh, doing everything we can to protect areas that are uh, of significance, uh, whether there's there's a specific plant community or habitat type that we're focusing on or watershed. Uh, 
make sure that we, we uh, recognize that there's a, there is a vast need for this kind of work throughout the, the state and the nation for that matter. Um, so I want to talk about a couple projects, and uh, so this is usually where I go into a little bit more detail about uh, the, the process of how we do land conservation work, but uh, I figured that would probably put y'all to sleep. Uh, so I'm going to talk about <coughs> this project and show y'all some pictures of what we're, what we're doing out here and, and what we protected. This is a, a project that I started uh, a couple years ago, and we actually ended up closing on it in 2015 in November. But it's a, it's a, a two-phase project called the Gordy Marsh, and this is a map of the property over here on the right. This is on Smith Point in Chambers County, a really, really diverse area that we call Gordy Marsh. And uh, what, what has maintained this diversity is the inability to get fresh water down in this area to farm rice. Uh, most of, a lot of Chambers County was, was converted in the 30s and 40s and 50s to, uh, to be used as rice farming and agriculture. Uh, and they could not get fresh water down this far, so it was, it was basically wasteland. They used it for a little bit of cattle grazing, uh, but preserved it uh, very, very well. Um, so we used uh, some grant funds, some charitable donations from, uh, from uh, various foundations and some private contributions to, to buy this, this uh, first phase of uh, 1,700 acres at fair market value. So we praised, praised the property uh, and, and bought a conservation easement. That means we're not the landowner, we are not uh, uh, responsible for maintenance of the property, but we do have a, an annual responsibility to come out there and, and inspect the property, take a look at what's going on, make sure that our restrictions that we placed on there are being abided by. Um, and our second phase is, is, the, is the property that's to the right, the, the second strange looking box. Uh, same landowner wants to do a, a second phase of this with the rest of this property down there and we're actively looking to secure funding for that property now. Another uh, project we've, we've recently completed, the Turtle Bayou Nature Preserve. We're, having a, we're going to have a grand opening in um, October, this is going to be a, a, a public access site. This is in uh, Chambers County. It's a really, really neat, diverse site. It has a, a big, open uh, wetland prairie complex uh, on the east side down along Lake Anahuac. It has uh, uh, cypress swamps along Turtle Bayou and a big mixed pine hardwood forest on the, uh, on, on the uh, east side of the road there. The um, so we have uh, uh, three elevated viewing platforms, about seven miles of hiking trails, an interpretive uh, signage, a, comp, uh, uh, a kayak launch, and we've done some uh, habitat improvements to uh, help uh, make this site uh, more uh, attractive for visitors as well as uh, healthy from an environmental standpoint. You hit the next button, you'll see some of our pictures of the property, and uh, I think it's going to be really great. And this is what I was going to—I was talking with Joe earlier. Uh, we haven't done a lot of, of baseline inventory work out here in terms of, of plant community. Uh, I'll be remiss if I didn't mention our new headquarters. We just purchased 30 uh, acres on the bay in Kima. Uh, very excited to kick off our capital campaign uh, to develop a permanent home for us. We're currently, uh, did just move offices, but we're still in an uh, office complex. Uh, we're going to have a, a big green uh, LEED certified building constructed and then uh, a, a variety of demonstration plots uh, to, that we can display all of the work that we do around the bay in one location here in Kima. It's, highly visible from a road and easily accessible. So just wanted to, to touch on that really quick, and I think the next one should be uh, a list of our events. Uh, fishing tournament on Saturday, it's not too late. If any ladies want to come out and join the fishing tournament. Uh, we have a meeting on storm surge protection on August 18th at Braves Landing. Um, Going to be uh, probably highly politically charged about what to do about the Ike Dyke and uh, various uh, efforts to protect our um, our, our industrial uh, communities here and along the bay from uh, storm surge related to hurricanes. And then we have a, uh, a big lunch and a big fundraiser September 27th, and then our bike ride on the bay October 17th and 18th. And with that, I am just five minutes over, so I will take questions. <laughs>